Hello again, and thank you all for joining us for the second part of our two-part discussion, In Conversation, a discussion on the mental health crisis in school-age children. My name is Christopher Morphew, Dean of the Johns Hopkins School of Education. In case you missed the first part of our discussion, which was centered on defining the mental health challenges adolescents face today, I'm joined by Dr. Elise Pass, a research professor in the Department of Mental Health within the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and Dr. Jody Miller, a postdoctoral fellow in the Counseling Department at the Johns Hopkins School of Education. In our last conversation, we went over data that defined the scale of the adolescent mental health crisis. We talked about some of the barriers to mental health that kids face, and we discussed the challenges that schools and educators face in tackling the problem. Elise, I'd love you to jump right in and ask, what are some examples of interventions that schools can use to address mental health? Okay, yeah, so there's a lot of different types of interventions. So let's just start with the ones that are kind of focused at all of the kids at the same time, universal prevention, but are really focused on them, right, on them as individuals and, and their skills. So there's um, a large market and a growing market, as you can imagine, with the increased awareness of the problems we face, where there are programs that are specifically trying to raise mental health awareness. So some of those things we talked about in that first segment about how do kids or adults know when something's problematic, mm -hmm. really teaching kids about how to recognize it within themselves or actually even within others, mm -hmm. specifically for adolescents. So we talked a little bit about this idea that like there's more eyes on kids in schools because of all the teachers and the adults. But really, especially as we move into adolescence, where kids are much more focused on each other than they are on the, the adults, mm -hmm. frankly, they're much more likely to share their concerns with each other. And so I've been involved with some different programs that can be used in either late, late middle school or in high school that are training kids to understand what does it feel like and look like to say, have a panic attack versus having anxiety disorder? What does it look like to feel depressed? Kind of really defining that for kids, helping them to recognize with their own symptoms, and then most importantly, how to seek help, both for themselves or if a peer tells them that there's something going on. So those are kind of like a broad umbrella that I would call like mental health awareness. Mm -hmm. um, then there's this, you mentioned it in our first segment actual, like the this movement towards social emotional learning. Um, and one definition that comes out of an, a large scale organization called CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning, has defined social emotional learning in these like five domains mm -hmm. um, in specific skills or competencies that schools can be teaching kids um, at all ages. Um, and that's where I'm saying there's a big market for these types of programs. There's a, a de decently large evidence base around um, a range of programs that actually help to teach kids things like relationship skills, mm -hmm. decision making um, that's responsible and really thoughtful. Like, if I do this, what will happen? <laughs> if I do that, what will happen? Okay, mm -hmm. which is my best option? Um, Self-awareness, so really attuning to their own feelings. Um, social awareness, attuning to other people's um, feelings. So these programs are kind of anchored around that. These are t teaching kids really, honestly, life skills. Mm -hmm. There's actually a survey that the broad scale parents, they don't love the word social emotional learning, but they like the idea of life skills. So it mm -hmm. is, it's, that's basically what it is. When you think about how do you develop the types of skills, the soft skills that help kids really successfully navigate school and, and later and how that can really sure. promote mental health. So those are, I would say, the two big buckets that I think about like universally that we're seeing a big movement and a big push in schools. From a universal program perspective, Jody, there's also emo emotional regulation and mm -hmm. check-ins like well check. Mm -hmm. So there's been a big movement to just ask students every day, how are you feeling? Because in that process, they're w working on their self-awareness. Mm -hmm. And then also giving adults really valuable information so that they can intervene. Because I think when you're talking about the continuum, right, so much of this is about like prevention. It's so much easier to catch an issue on day one or two than when kind of it's been cascading for weeks on end. And mm -hmm. so there are tools like WellCheck and others that exist. There are also cool programs now that are arising in schools that focus on like community building, like advisory programs. And that's been something that's mm -hmm. been, that is in many of our partners where WellCheck is being kind of housed, if you will. So mm -hmm. students are checking in during advisory. Mm -hmm. And that's like a great safe space for students where they can try to learn to get to know each other and build this community and trust and so they can talk mm -hmm. about some of these issues they also go over like announcements and and deal with other issues that may arise as a community and so that's another way that schools are trying to build these other 
relationship building skills and or sense of community, which we know are so important. Yeah, well check I think is a great example of like a mental health awareness and that social emotional piece, right? It, mm -hmm. it is really dealing directly with self-awareness, which is mm -hmm. one of the five areas for social emotional competencies. It's raising kids' awareness and their identification of what's going on. It's helping the adults to kind of connect those dots. And I would say these all live within this umbrella of like how do we promote well-being. Sometimes the trap mm -hmm. becomes that we do this, not that, or we, but you know, what Jody's alluding to is I think a lot of what the schools are really grappling with is like, how do we do a lot of these things at the same time? So sure. how do we build community and belonging, which we know is a protective or promotive factor mm -hmm. for mental health? We know that when kids are more connected to each other and their teacher, they're more likely to engage in sure. a classroom mm -hmm. environment in a more sure. positive way. That helps academics, of course. Um, so there's like a lot of things that something like that can really support and, and schools are really working um, towards how do we really integrate these things but all of them relate back to what we talked about in that first session about what are some of the risk factors and what are the promotive factors and how do we deal with those in schools in a way that is for everyone and can really have a big impact with kind of a low cost of time or sure. investment mm -hmm. in terms of like reallocating t dedicated time to it within the school day. And you talked about you both have talked about connection and mm -hmm. um, you can think about check-in apps like WellCheck or you can mm -hmm. think about emotional regulation and you mm -hmm. can think about that for yourself but mm -hmm. what and we've talked a little bit about teachers but what about students for other students mm -hmm. adolescents for other mm -hmm. adolescents and those kinds of life skills social awareness that you talked about before how do we how do we help kids help mm -hmm. their friends I think, um, start. Sure, I think about that a lot, both in my work and then more specifically in the context of WellCheck. So one thing we have is a check on a friend button. So it allows mm -hmm. students to kind of put a friend on the radar of adults. And that's important because especially in the middle and high school age, mm -hmm. you might have a better sense of how your friends are doing than the adults exactly. might. And you mm -hmm. also might see bullying that might happen that does kind of doesn't happen oh, that teachers might not always see. Mm -hmm. So that's important. And then we also one of the dashboards is this emotional bar graph that that shows all the different times that emotions have been selected over a week or a month or whatever it may be. And we find that partners will share that with students so they can look at how are we doing as a community? And the beauty is that of that is that students can see I'm not the only one feeling sad or lonely or stressed or worried or some of these more vulnerable emotions. Mm -hmm. And so the bigger question is like, how do we develop this greater sense of empathy among our young people? And it's so hard right now when they don't necessarily see empathy being elicit, like being demonstrated from leadership at all different mm -hmm. levels. But like, this is our time to think about how do we help students see what how other people are feeling and and then think about how do I take mm -hmm. care of them and there are some really great mental health first aid programs for students especially in high school mm -hmm. what you were talking about as far yeah. as like I can talk support a, a peer yeah you would too. yeah so I've worked in the, uh, a few different spaces so in the mental health awareness space there is a mental health first aid program that started to help people identify generally mental health crisis or problems in other people. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was another emergence around youth mental health first aid which was focus on adults who interact with youth. So mm -hmm. it would be for like school educators that could get trained in youth mental health first aid where they were learned, they would learn how to and get like certified in being able to support kids who are showing those signs. The most recent iteration, it was developed in Australia and had been adapted in the US and I was a part of a pilot study for that. We have a study that was um, published on that. It's called Teen Mental Health First Aid and it's this idea of mm -hmm. teaching teens to mm -hmm. identify in their friends. And it's really just giving them the steps of like, how do you actually have these conversations? It's trying to take the burden off of the kids a little bit. Like, you aren't going to solve this problem and you shouldn't carry the weight of that. Mm -hmm. What you should do is help connect your, your friend to resources mm -hmm. and not be afraid to do that. Um, and so it gives them ways to honestly talk to their peer about wanting to seek help. So that's one space I've kind of worked in. Like Jody, I've worked in this space of like some integration around community building and, and social emotional learning in a much more structured curriculum area. So I mentioned there are a lot of programs and a lot of them have an evidence base, um, but they've been largely focused on K through eight. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a lot in the high school level that mm -hmm. shows an evidence base. So years ago, I had a district that I had worked with in the past say we've really been scaling advisory, we're working on community building mm -hmm. activities, they, they're they working very explicitly in restorative practices, community building circles, mm -hmm. um, which is just the convening of kids with teachers, 
each you know day or week, whatever it is, to just get to know each other in a non-academic way, in a power-sharing way. Everybody sits in the same chairs, mm-hmm. and there's there's processes that allows them to all engage. Mm-hmm. Um, and they said, we, we want to do this work in the high school. There's no programs. Can you help us? And so I had a grant funded. It started to be funded right during COVID. Um, and we've been working for four years together to develop actual like social emotional learning curriculum, like a much more traditional curricular approach that integrates with community building circles. So we have a, a unit on um, that's identifying like how to be successful in high school. And it's like setting goals, mm-hmm. um, smart goals, et cetera. And then like, we're not gonna ask about the academics in those circles, but we're gonna find ways to have them share like what's a goal you have for yourself? Mm-hmm. What's something you're hoping to do when you get out of high school? And we're kind of giving those to teachers so it's ready to go and integrated as opposed to kind of siloed. But one piece that we've heard from students when I've been developing this is we want more on mental health. Mm -hmm. But this is a course we're trying to do in regular classrooms with all the teachers and we're mindful that not all the teachers are gonna be ready for that. Mm -hmm. Your teen mental health first aid is taught by like a health teacher Mm -hmm. or a counselor or both and we're in the space of everybody Mm -hmm. doing this at the same time in the morning. And so we've tried to bridge that and it's harder. Mm -hmm. And so I think what you're doing is really interesting because it kind of gets into that space more deeply in a way that we have not done with this program, Well Connected, that I've been working on for a few years. Mm -hmm. So we are still just in the early stages. We don't have data yet to look at its effects. We're working on that now. Um, But I think there are gaps. And then that was your point earlier. Your Mm -hmm. question in the first session was, what's out there? What's promising? I think Mm -hmm. there is a lot to build on. um, But there's a need to think about adapting for different age groups, Mm -hmm. different communities, different school settings that are facing different challenges, like the rural identity, like that's a whole other set of circumstances. So I think there's a lot of work to be done, but there's a lot of good promise to build on. And and how much of this, you mentioned restorative practices, right? Mm -hmm. And we can talk a little bit about the research um, that examines restorative practices. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I'm struck by in programs like that are it's not just for for the kids, it's also for the parents, it's also for the community, right? Bringing everybody together. How much of this this kind of work, these strategies for improving group dynamics, are getting uh, children and schools to think about life skills like they think about math skills? They're, they are real skills. Mm-hmm. We, can, we can determine what they are. We can describe them. We mm-hmm. can define them. We can, ta- we can train you. We can help you do better in them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the differences in something like restorative practices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, you've brought up a lot there. There there are a lot of dynamics in terms of shifting how we think about what the work of a school is mm-hmm. and what are the skills. The research just, there are no questions in the research about the importance of these soft life skills mm-hmm. for later success, for graduating high school, for post-secondary success, for employment. We know what successful people look like. We know what successful people look like. And it it is important to Mm. to understand math and English and all those things are absolutely important. But these emotional intelligence indicators, these softer skills Mm -hmm. are what make leaders. Mm -hmm. They're what kind of gives us the success on that really far end of the continuum. And to not be thinking about these is completely missing the boat. There was a big report that like Fortune 400 companies came up with like, I don't remember all the methodology, but they went to basically business companies and said, what are the issues we need to be focusing on in education? And out of 10 of them, like seven of them are nameable social emotional competencies. Nobody's like, do better with algebra, right? right? I mean, we need to do better with math in the United States. That is also not a question. Um, But those skills are so essential that perseverance Mm -hmm. to be able to engage in hard academic curriculum. Mm-hmm. There's so many of these soft skills that I think even conflict resolution, mm-hmm. correct. empathy, all mm-hmm. these yeah. mm-hmm. all of them to 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 make it in our increasingly complex society. So, um, you know, I think the the com- the restorative practice one is interesting because what that's really trying to do is flip on its head like power dynamics in schools and say mm-hmm. we need to kind of be with our kids on a similar level and get to know them. And we need to embrace the community. When it's done really well, you really truly can do community circles. Mm-hmm. And you do them with staff. You do them with families. There are circles even to deal with conflict. A high level of training is needed for that. I, I cannot sure. go past that statement without saying that. But, you know, this that basic foundation of building relationships is also really important and will stay with kids 
for the rest of their life if we can do it well, but it also just makes them more readily available. Sure. When we think about mental health, we think about well-being, it's what is your bandwidth to be available to learn what your math or social studies or science or English teacher is there to teach you. Mm -hmm. And I think when we can kind of get to a baseline of connectedness and calmness in the school environment, we're going to do better with all of those goals. And Jody, could you talk a little bit about some, some interventions or strategies that are focused on specific kinds of groups? So you mentioned resilience, sure. maybe grit groups, things sure. like that. One thing that was, that's been really wonderful is seeing the proliferation of like some of these kind of subgroups. So we found that partners will have like girl groups, right? Like lunch groups mm -hmm. where girls mm -hmm. will learn how to like r deal with conflict and like navigate different social challenges. We've also seen partners have these really great opportunity for folks who've been who've experienced community violence. And this is traditionally mm -hmm. a group of young males who like don't always get to kind of have vulnerable moments or be like mm -hmm. outwardly vulnerable. And they have a special group where they like talk to someone from the community who has experienced similar things. Mm -hmm. So you have this a aspect of like advising and mentorship, but also a, a really safe space for people to kind of share these really hard things that they've experienced. And mm -hmm. I think we're hopefully, we'll continue to see more of those because they're really powerful and they're making small communities within much larger communities, which we know is so important. And that's kind of moved us from this idea of the universal, where we're gonna to try to give things to everybody, mm -hmm. which is destigmatizing, it has better reach, and mm -hmm. it's a little bit more cost effective in some ways, but then what we're moving into is this idea of like targeted interventions. That's very mm -hmm. much in that public health framework of like how do we layer on supports to, to get people to their best optimal development, and so there's real thinking in schools around like how do we provide targeted or even more intensive interventions that are a little bit more individualized to kids who might have show signs of risk sure. and need something different. Mm -hmm. Like I've been exposed to community violence and I need to be brought together to be able to unpack that. That's not something maybe everybody needs, mm -hmm. but it's certainly something that can really help mitigate some of the, the, the outcomes that could happen if we don't do that. We don't address those concerns. So we can we can teach kids and school leaders and teachers principals. We can help them identify. We can put uh, students in different kinds of groups and, mm -hmm. and target them. What about changing the environment, right? Yeah. I suspect one of the questions we'll get later will be about phones and mm -hmm. social media. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when we think about altering the environment, what comes to mind as effective interventions and strategies there? Do you want to start or you want me to start? You can start. Okay, yeah, I mean, I think this is where I, it, you know, I'm a trained psychologist and I think a lot about organizational health and well-being and, mm -hmm. and how organizations, the places we work as adults and mm -hmm. the places that kids go to school really impact our well-being. Um, and this is, in fact, maybe one of our best ways to universally impact people in a positive way that maybe isn't going to be a known entity in time for them at all, right? It's different than sitting down for 30 minutes and learning about coping skills. And so there are some frameworks out there. There's a, a whole movement in our country. I've been linked into a lot of research about this in Maryland, um, positive behavior supports, like getting interventions and supports. It's more like about a framework for thinking about how we alter the environment to better promote um, student development. And so um, what the positive behavior supports and PBIS has kind of moved us towards thinking was this idea like we actually as adults mm -hmm. have to be really consistent about what we're doing. Sure. I, mean, I mean, anyone that's been in a school, even me, as long ago as that was, we all know there was that teacher who like you can never chew gum in the class mm -hmm. and, you, mm -hmm. and you get in so much trouble if you did mm -hmm. and the other teacher that lets that and a lot of other things go. And so the idea behind that is like as adults we have to agree upon a certain set of expectations. We have to teach that. We have to reinforce that. And we have to be able to say, there are things that happen that no matter what, you as a teacher have to deal with it there. And we're not going to be putting a kid out of the classroom. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to suspend them. Because we have a problem with excluding too many kids in our mm -hmm. country. Certain kinds of kids. Exactly. Yeah, and certain kinds of kids in particular, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you know, people talk about the school to prison pipeline, which is a very real thing. And PBIS is not going to be the panacea for it. And in fact, unfortunately, it hasn't shown the kind of effects we'd like in narrowing the gaps for mm -hmm. racial ethnic groups in particular. But what it has been shown to do is it does decrease the number of times that teachers are sending kids to the office for behaviors. It can kind of set that consistency and that that tone and shift a climate. We've even found there's research that shows that teachers actually feel better about the environment that they're in when they've undertaken mm -hmm. this activity together, where they've 
really sharpened expectations and been consistent. And and for those parents at home, I, I mean, as a PBIS researcher, I often find myself in the boat of like, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. We know it's hard. It is hard yeah. work mm -hmm. to be consistent and really mm -hmm. respond. But when when kids know what expectations are, they thrive. Adults do too, it turns mm -hmm. out. For anyone that's ever been a boss, mm -hmm. you know when you actually do a better job of setting expectations, people mm -hmm. do better on delivering. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing that's shown a lot of promise. It's in over 26,000 schools in our country because it's funded out of the U.S. Department of Education and there's there's relatively little cost associated with doing it. It's not like buying a curriculum. Mm -hmm. So for schools, it's had a really good adoption. And what I love about that when I think about public health and I think about how do we scale, it's an interesting and excellent model for thinking about how do we get things replicated, excuse me, replicated at scale, mm -hmm. right, is things like having infrastructure for technical assistance, sure. low cost, adaptability. Those are things that I think have been really successful at PBIS in our country. I also think when we think about schools as a whole and the environment, we ha we can't not talk about the adults, right? Mm -hmm. We've seen yeah. this widespread shortage of teachers, and we know that for the folks who are still in classrooms, their Ooh. emotional well-being and mental health is compromised. And mm -hmm. so the adults can't take care of the kids unless we're also taking care of the adults. And so I think that has to be part of this larger calculus of mm -hmm. how do we make these systems healthier in general. And so it's really hard and complex to think about supporting adult mental health, but Right now, probably the most obvious first take is like, how do we take something off the plate of teachers? So mm -hmm. smaller class sizes. It, uh, are there ways that they can have fewer different prep periods? You hear some teachers are teaching four different types of classes a day. That is mm -hmm. so much planning and grading and brain space to mm -hmm. kind of navigate those different topics. We also know teachers, unfortunately, are often ended up um, ending up covering for other teachers or covering mm -hmm lunch or other duties that kind of take away their precious work time and or just sense of autonomy. So we know, unfortunately, they are, a lot of them are feeling really burned out, emotionally exhausted. We probably need some more support to help them navigate student behaviors and student mental health. So we can't think about the system without also thinking about the right. teachers and counselors and, and principals because it doesn't just stop there. Yeah, the workplace mental health is a very real phenomenon. If I could have my wish list of things that we would do that would be really outside the box, it would be some of the things that Jody named. I would also say we should be thinking about like some of our longstanding logistical like decisions that just don't work for teachers or for kids, the way that schedules are even made. Sure. You know, if you're the sleepy kid who can't get up every morning and high math is your first, yeah. high school starts at 7.30 and you have math every day, first period, mm -hmm. you're sleepy that whole year. What if math was sometimes at seven, but sometimes at eight? It's a logistical nightmare for our really large schools. It's very outside the box, but it's an example of some of our structures are just sure. not set up for teachers, mm -hmm. for educators, for leaders to thrive, and they're not set up for kids to thrive. And you brought up the phones. I mean, to me, this is, an, this is a hard and easy problem to solve. On the one hand, you could say, we have a really hard time getting kids to get rid of the phones. Mm -hmm. Part of that's the inconsistency. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of models of places where they really do set a culture and tone that they're not leaving it to the teacher, which is more stress, more right. burden, mm -hmm. more difficulty right. for the teacher. When the school says, decisions made, this is our policy in schools, and or the district, and we enforce it in this way, and they're actually consistent, yep. and the kids know that they can't bypass the system, it works, and it's better for everybody. Because you can't focus. I mean, as an adult, I am like learning, you know, my phone needs to not be near me during meetings sure. because it's a distraction. Mm -hmm. It's designed to be. It's yeah. designed to be yeah. a distraction. It's yeah. designed to keep all of us addicted to it. And yeah. so, you know, I think that would be a great like policy thing. And that doesn't take time in the day, right? Maybe in the beginning to enforce it and get there, but that's not like saying carve out time sure. to do a group and get a mental health provider in the building that can do it. Well, this has been a, another great discussion. Before we switch to our live Q&A in just a moment, I'd like to thank both Elise and Jody for taking the time from their busy schedules to share their work and their research with the Hopkins community. I also want to thank all of you, our live audience, who tuned in for the conversations. We appreciate your interest in learning more about this critically important topic affecting youths today. If you haven't yet, we encourage you now to add your questions and comments in the Hopkins at Home live chat just below. We look forward to answering them. Thank you again, and have a wonderful afternoon. Good evening, everyone. 
Thank you for joining us as we conclude our discussion with a live Q&A session featuring Drs. Elise Pass and Jody Miller. I'm Lindsay Askew, Assistant Director of Constituent Engagement at the JHU School of Education, and I'll be moderating tonight's session, uh, ensuring that your questions reach our scene panelists. If you have any questions, um, or if you haven't already, I encourage you to utilize the Hawkins at Home chat feature to share your thoughts and questions. Uh, we're eager to engage with you. Uh, to kick things off, I'll pose a question that's been on my mind. Um, should educators in mental health spaces look at more modern theories of human development as the world has changed since stalwarts like Erickson, Vygotsky, and Kohlberg? Sorry, mute. Um, I can get started with that. I think that's a really interesting question because I think at the core of what's being asked there is, do we have to evolve? Do we have to be thinking differently about development? And I would say, I think we have to think differently about how we support development especially in the space of schools um, and really communities and families everywhere. Um, because it's true that there's been a lot that has changed since a lot of our theories of human development came out. Um, but I would argue that those developmental theories are still very relevant today, the way humans evolve. When we think about the different stages that humans go through, the types of skill sets and challenges that they're facing and working through in different stages of their life. Um, we think about like Erickson who outlined very clearly. I mean, while, you know, there maybe there should be some science and, and more um, energy put towards seeing, like do those still all resonate and, and play out in, in modern day? But as a trained psychologist myself and thinking about the ones that were mentioned here, you know, it would be hard to argue that these basic foundational ther theories of psychology and, and development are are no longer relevant. Um, and we, I think it's really more about shifting the way that adults think about supporting development of youth. So ones that didn't get thrown in here, like when we think about like Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs, um, that's something that came up, I think, in, in part one. Um, you know, those things are still very much at play and, and maybe more now than ever. And I think some of what I worry about is actually not that we're not staying modern in how we think about development, but we're actually losing sight of human development and human needs. That there's so much importance to connectedness, community, belonging. And while our modern world doesn't kind of see that in the same way, we don't engage in the same way as we did when these theories started to come out, I'd say the importance of those things are just clearer now than ever. That's an amazing answer. Jody, do you have anything to throw in there? I I mostly echo Elise. I think I think I think our challenge now is not to try to review development and those stages and theories, but rather understand what students today need and recognize that that might look different than what it did 10, 20, 30 years ago. I think one thing we really struggle with as a system and society is moving away from the mold of like, this is how it's always been done. And there's a lot, there are many good reasons generally for why things have been done a certain way, but really pushing ourselves to challenge that idea it, with, with the information we have about today's context. So I think it's less perhaps about development and more about recognizing that the circumstances around children today, their development might influence how the state of schools or how we exist with them in society. That was excellent. Um, we actually have a couple more questions. Really excited to get to these. Uh, Cindy wanted to know, uh, how can we get all these amazing ideas into educational policy statewide or nationally? Is there anything regular folks can do to help? I'll start and then I'll pass it to Elise as you also wear a public health hat, which I think will be great. I think from, I think probably being involved in, I think starting at the local level. So being involved in school, school boards and showing up at those meetings, I think will be more really important and having your voice heard. I think right now it can be challenging as school board meetings feel more contentious than ever before, but just kind of trying to communicate with local folks as much as possible. And then I think it starts there because that way we'll see how different um, experiences in districts go. For example, if you're able to move new policies into your district, that allows things to spread to other local districts and you have testimonials and stories and data to support the great work that you're doing. But Elise also has a public health hat. So. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm, I was actually going to say the same thing. I mean, for regular citizens, beyond even just getting to the meetings, I mean, there's often 
public forum for submitting comments to state or local boards of education. But most, a lot of state boards of ed have moved to a, a voting model. It used to be that a lot more places had appointees. And so, I mean, a really great way is to just stay a, aware and your civic duty with voting, um, get to know the profiles of the folks that are running to be on your boards of ed and that their, um, that their ideas um, reflect some of the things that you know about or appreciate or want to encourage. Um, I think at the broader level, um, regular folks are often part of families, so we all have our role um, in, in, in our family lives, um, whether that's as a parent or a sibling or as an auntie or an uncle or a grandparent or whatever it is, or even just a good neighbor. I mean, I think we all can kind of contribute to some of the things that's not a policy level thing, but that's kind of at that really micro level of the way that we influence um, development. I think it just matters at all the different levels. Um, and then it, I, I think it's really just around community engagement. I think when I think about like the public health hat or what researchers or, or, or educators can do, that, that's a slightly different role, right? So I, I wanna kind of acknowledge that somebody specifically asked about regular folks. I'm assuming that means like, if I'm not an educator, I'm not a researcher. Um, but you know, I think that is a lot of what all of us that are in the space of, um, of practice and research is really about communicating and getting our information out there. Um, I think about that in like technical terms of like our translation of research into practice um, and really being true to walking that walk. Um, that's, a, that's a major goal for the work that we do at Johns Hopkins University is trying to translate. Some of that is part of this Hopkins at home. So, you know, I think getting educated as a regular folk in these different ways you can engage helps you to kind of be in a more informed um, civilian and citizen and the folks that are kind of on the other side of it should be doing all that they can to make sure that there's great things going out to people. So those of, of you who might be in schools, you know, just helping to connect with parents and sending resources and getting them educated and getting them resources. I know my own child goes to a public school that has an excellent school counseling website with parent resources and webinars and books like those types of things go really far so i'll say for all the different people i think we can all have an impact in in trying to get the word out and that kind of creates a different kind of societal view on some of these issues that can then translate into policy thank you elise and thank you for the great question cindy we really appreciate it um have a couple more here um kathy asked um how can we help high schoolers, even in the higher grade levels, uh, if they don't have these sort of restorative skills uh, developed earlier in the educational process, right? So if they're they're coming into these sort of solutions later in their in their educational pathway. Like, how can they better adapt at that age? Uh, Jody, I'll start with you. Sure. So I think, well, ideally, some of these practices might begin when students are in elementary, or middle school. High school is still a great time because their brains are changing and developing so quickly and they're taking in so many different stimuli and information that they weren't necessarily five years ago when they were in elementary or middle school. So I think, though, what that means from the educator practitioner perspective is like building the communities slowly and intentionally and with patience, which is really hard. But thinking about advisories, I know that's something that's really common in high schools these days. And like thinking about how do we build this as a safe space or a community for everybody and not jumping into necessarily restorative circles, which is something that takes a lot of practice and training from everybody, but like kind of chipping away at these skills and helping students develop them and practice them. And part of that also includes modeling that both like as educators and folks in school, but also as parents or relatives or family members or adults in the lives of young people? How do we show them how to respond to conflict and or deal with challenging things that arise? And so I think certainly high school is not too late. They have so much time to develop. We're constantly a work in progress and, and just kind of helping plant those seeds within students of so that they're building the skills and not going from zero to 100. And when it doesn't work at 100, kind of freaking out and feeling like our high schoolers are so behind, but just taking it in increments, knowing that they might not have had some of the practice that other students might have. 
I love that you picked up on that because I also got that vibe of like, is it too late? And I would say it's never too late. It's never too late to kind of expand our skill set. Um, but and as Jody says, I mean, adolescence is the second most brain growth that happens in our lifespan, second to when we're infants. So adolescents are ripe for this stuff. And she she laid out all of the most amazing things there. So the only thing I would add to say is that adolescence is also a prime time to get their voice in it and to really help to, and that is a shift. I mean, Jody already made mention of some of soapbox of mine, which is like, we have to learn how to break out of like old models. And we have a very like expert educational model and not as student centered, not as student driven. And in high school in particular is just getting to hear from the students. Um, so if there's a concern in a school that it is coming too late um, and we don't have all the foundational skills, the amazing thing is you've got this school filled of young people who have incredible ideas. And I would say, ask them, ask them how we can support your skill development in a way that you would find engaging and exciting and ways that they might lead that for the upper mm -hmm. class the upper class students, like for specifically, like you're in 11th and 12th grade, how might you support your like newly emerging, early transitioning like students, like coming into ninth grade and going into 10th grade? Um, so I think those would be the only things. And those align back to that question about like theories of development. So what we know is really a big part of adolescence, which is need for autonomy, interest in peers, and the um, identity formation that they're all going through. So I, I think this is a great time for them to try out those skills, practice skills. They're trying to figure out like, which of my identities do I wanna carry with me into adulthood? So it's, it's perfectly right for this. Awesome, excellent. Thank you so much for that, Elise and Jody. Um, we have a two part question actually from Julia. So I actually wanna to toss it to Jody to start and then uh, we'll have input from you, Elise, on the second part. Uh, Jody, can you share some examples for integrating mental health education into curriculum in age appropriate ways? Sure. So I, I think it can be done certainly. And I, so I taught high school biology before pursuing my PhD and starting well check. And so I would talk about it. I would talk about mental health and I had high schoolers. So I, I kind of was able to approach it from a scientific perspective at times when we talked about our brains and our bodies, like literally what's happening in the brain. And in that process, help students understand. I use that opportunity in particular when we're talking about like neurochemicals in our brains and to help students understand that like we should be thinking about me mental illness in a similar way to we think about physical illness and like trying to think about stigma and how do we take care of ourselves uh, with younger students, I think there are lots of different ways to help students in science classes, and especially because that's kind of my area of expertise, thinking about their bodies and the benefits of things like movement and stretching and these things that might sound simple, but are, you're like planting seeds for students to kind of understand this bigger picture of wellness, because I don't think in necessarily in elementary middle school, we have to be using... I would argue maybe in middle school, students are seeing more of it. But in elementary school, we don't necessarily have to use like mental health terminology. We can use terms like well-being or keeping our bodies and brains healthy. So it feels a little bit less intimidating for maybe children and adults alike. Um, I've seen folks in English classrooms use opportunities through literature to kind of connect to mental health, whether it's elementary school stories, thinking about how might that character feel and like how what what happens when you feel that way or what does it look like in your body when you feel that way or how do you make yourself feel better when you feel that way and just giving students an opportunity to kind of see some of their own challenges in others and that and both like fictional but also then at times not um, in in real life and real life among each other. And then I think in history, what we've seen is using history as opportunities also for students to develop empathy. And it's maybe not traditional like mental health, but how would you feel when you if you had to like cross the country when you were a kid in a horse and in, in like in a wagon Oregon Trail style, right? And that is really important because it helps students think about what they need and how do they look after one another and themselves. And so I think there are lots of creative ways that don't have to feel like, and today we're talking about depression. That's right. And then if I can just add, and I would say, I would also say, in addition to all that, which is absolutely spot on, it's also okay earlier than we think to say to our kids, let's talk about depression. 
-hmm. because the reality of our kids lives are that they are seeing their peers or themselves struggling with mental health. And so um, I think that there are so many beautiful ways that Jody talked about weaving it in, in a way that it's not just a standalone mental health curriculum. And I think that is so important for it to really stick. And, and so many skills that she brought out that you can be building. It's just a beautiful example. Um, and also it's true that by middle school, kids are very aware of substance use. They are aware of discussions around suicidality. Like this is just the reality of what kids are facing in, in today's society. And if we as adults can't talk about that, then our non-words stigmatize. And when we talk about it scientifically in a, in a way that isn't scary to our, us as adults and, and to the kids, it is developmentally appropriate. And it can also just be in ways of, when I think of like the parent hat, of the lens of just asking open-ended questions. When you hear something that's happening and just being able to respond in the moment, not making a huge big deal and saying something like, tell me more about what you heard about that in school today. Um, you know, I think that's, it's, it's really important to know that the kids are actually often more ready than we are as adults. Yeah. Uh, that was a really good final point. Um, and so uh, the other question that Julie asked was, asked was, you know, how can parents best advocate for kids' mental health needs in the classroom, especially with older kids, uh, when the power dynamic with teachers might not be so balanced? Yeah, um, I think I, there's a broad spectrum here. So just as a, to share, I, my background and training is in school psychology. Um, so I think there are some really formal ways that I'll talk a little bit about just to kind of, again, get like word out there for people about, you know, their parents' rights and how to help your kid. So if you're in a space where your child has a diagnosable um, disability, um, there are different routes that you can be supporting in mental, like, and advocating for your child. Mental health disorders specifically are a little bit more tricky sometimes in schools because to get any sort of official um, documentation and plans put in place, you have to show that there's an educational impact if you're going the route of special education. But so just let's start there. So if there is something where you feel like there is a special education need because you see an educational impact on your, on your child's um, kind of that systematic, pursuing those avenues are your right as a parent. And as soon as you say to the school, I would like to have my child assess, they have to at least respond in a fixed amount of time and determine whether an assessment is warranted. Another route where kids with mental health um, challenges or, or disorders might find some support is through a 504 plan. So that comes out of the American Disabilities Act or ADA 504, um, which essentially is a, saying that people that have disabilities should have equitable experiences in, in any situation. So for example, if you have a physical disability and you're in a wheelchair, that you should have access to get into a school building that allows you to do that in your wheelchair. Well, the same is true for a child with a mental health disorder. And that would be another kind of thing a parent could advocate or, or seek out. My sense is that maybe the question wasn't that. Maybe it was a little bit more around, I know that my child is having some struggles and some of it might be normal adolescence and some of it might be situational or circumstantial. And how do I communicate with a school? And I think that really comes down to partnerships. And Jody and I both are big advocates of, of partnerships and talked a bit about that in this series. Um, and it's really about communication. I can say as um, somebody who is trained as a school psychologist, does education research and is a parent, um, myself with middle childhood age kids, so I'm in that tough space. Um, I, I personally always try to start with building those relationships very early on, being present at events, introducing myself, and thanking the teachers, honestly, because it's really hard work and what they're doing is really heroic. So also what that helps me with is uh, when something is problematic for me and I'm feeling like I'm not thinking my kids' needs are being met or something's being missed, I, don't, I know that I'm going to be heard in a different way than if I've never talked to this teacher or to this principal or this counselor before. And so I think the relationships are really important and they're easy to build. It just takes some time. I, I know I recognize schools don't always have the best lines of communication. A lot of parents might struggle to know how to engage, but I would just encourage you to just to try to find different ways that you might communicate and create those relationships. Um, I can't, I don't know if I address that whole question, I Lindsay. I can also hop in quickly as someone who taught high school. 
I think mm -hmm. having, and, and this really echoes what Elise said, because I think especially when we think about our high school teachers who have students for, you know, you could have between 25 and 35 students in a classroom for 45 minutes a day, and then you have five more of those. And so it's really hard sometimes to keep tabs on how all of your students are doing. And so I think that it's actually really helpful for the teacher to have some sense that something might be going on. And so like some communication from parents and encourage and encouraging students to also kind of communicate with teacher and maybe teachers and maybe having a conference, depending on the student's comfort level with the teacher, the student, and a parent or the counselor or some other like trusted person in the building. That way they can almost serve as a team for the student and think about what does the student need? Are there certain skills that the student might need additional support with? I think about sometimes the students might struggle with organization and then they like lose assignments. So like what are systems that can be designed to support that student without being punitive and being understanding. That way the student is developing those skills and without feeling embarrassed or ashamed and feels support in that process. And so I think communication is huge just because I I, I think so often so many educators are, are so well-intentioned. We're just we're outnumbered. There's so many students and so many different needs and and personalities and identities that we want to try to understand. It just can be really hard and sometimes that information might get missed. It's just that open line of communication to the extent that people are comfortable. And if maybe the there isn't that comfort with the teacher, finding another advocate in a counselor or admin or somebody else in the school who can support the parent and the student. Two things I'll follow up on. Um, Jody won't plug it for herself, so I will. This is the beauty of her well check work, um, is to try to create a system that puts in place where kids can be checking in and the teachers have a better pulse on what's happening with kids and their community. And that's something we can be doing on our side, right? Um, and the last thing I'll say about something that you said made me think of this, Jody, was around the parents is parents do need to be advocates for their kids and and it's hard work and it's intimidating at times and they feel like they're not the expert and the, and the advocates and then the people in the school are but you are the expert on your kid um, and finding a, an authentic way to communicate with schools that makes you feel comfortable but allows you to do it is really important but it's also important when we think especially of our teens is teaching them to self-advocate as well asking them like what is it that you need from me or you would like from this teacher or talking to them about skills of how do they navigate it. So organization could be one. Like, what is it that we want to see the school do for you? And what's something you want to be doing for you? Helping them to set goals and advocate for themselves. And so that you are not carrying it as a parent alone, but also so you're equipping your kid to be ready for the world around them. Because as they grow up at even further and they get into the world even more, they're going to need those skills. And also, sorry, Lindsay, just one thing that Elise made me think about is also recognizing progress and like steps forward. I think so often our young people feel like it's like zero or 100 and either I like did it perfectly or it is terrible. And like, how do we help? Because that's part of developing resilience is like, I have made progress. I am not there yet, but I'm going to celebrate the progress that I have made because I I try to I try to remind my students that we're all works in progress, that you don't have to have all the answers today or get it right today. It's just like, let's try to get it more right today than we did yesterday. Mm. I've I have um, shared with this team to put out some of like the books on my own night table for parenting as a psychologist that I personally have read. And one of the books that I read recently talks a lot about the need to fail out loud for your kids as a parent. Mm -hmm. um, and that that Jody, that made me think of it when you were talking about, you know, this idea that this of incremental success, some of it is that the kids don't see what that really looks like. They see like the polished version of adults and that we as teachers, educators, mental health providers and parents can all do our part in failing out loud for them and showing them when when we're struggling or how we're monitoring our progress or how we're moving towards a goal but not quite there yet. I have the 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 unique opportunity as a parent where I do a lot of writing, I have lots of track changes, lots of red pen if you will. I show my kids it all the time. I say, "Come look, mommy writes for a living. Come look at how much I edited my own writing or how much my colleague edited my writing because I want them to see that it's it, it takes Resilience, it takes time, it takes effort. Um, and that's another thing, not just advocating, but really modeling for your kid when you're struggling with something, when you're trying to incrementally 
be more successful at something. Well, there's a lot of red ink in the life. It's best to expect that. Um, so we have uh, about 10 more minutes. I want to get through about two more questions if possible. Uh, one is from Cindy. Uh, she had a second question. She wanted to know if mental health is becoming a bigger focus in teacher training in general, especially in programs like the J2 School of Education, um, clinical mental health counseling programs or you know, uh, MS Ed programs, but also in continuing training for current teachers. Hi, uh, Jody. Sure. I know that that's a big thing we're talking about within the Hopkins ecosystem and community. So for folks who don't know, we have the mental, we have the the counseling program, which has two tracks, school counseling and then clinical mental health counseling. And then we have some teacher prep programs, one of which the new one is teaching well. And that really focuses on, it has a big like STEM component, but also woven into the fabric of that is thinking about teacher and student well-being. And so it has become a lot more pervasive in some of the curricula in higher education when we think about training teachers, because it's so important that teachers are at least aware of the sociocultural context in which our students are coming to school and how that may be related to their academic ability or achievement and or emotional well-being. And so there, I don't think we're where we need to be yet. Um, I think we're making progress. I think there are lots of competing factors when we think about training teachers because there are so many different responsibilities that they have and so many different skills and like not pieces of knowledge that they need to to learn and develop and have in these relatively short programs. But it is certainly top of mind among a lot of our higher education programs that have teaching teacher training um, masters or certification programs. And quick teaching well plug. It's also a low to zero debt program as well, which I know helps with a lot of teacher anxiety coming out of school. Um, Elise? I don't really have much to add there. I would say that time is precious and there's a lot of things that are a struggle to get consistently embedded into training. And I would say that Hopkins is certainly talking about it and working on it. And there are probably many other programs that are, but, you know, I think from an accreditation standpoint, like, I don't know that that's part of it yet for like accrediting um, teacher prep programs, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing I think a lot about is like, what are some of the bigger levers to pull to kind of ensure that consistency? But I, I would agree, I think there's a lot more awareness. Awesome. Uh, and uh, we also have one from Joe. Uh, he's got a really sort of great research to practice question. Um, you know, schools have, should schools have a mental health counterpart to physical education? Um, would these resources or interventions be more useful in person, so in one-on-one -on -one environments when needed, or could we do it in like a separate classroom environment? Like, hey, this is your phys, phys, ed, phys ed component, and here's your mental ed component. Um, is that a good way to teach resiliency? Sure. I would start, I think that's actually happening in a lot of places. So I think a lot of places have like, um, like, phys ed and wellness together. So sometimes it's like half a semester of health, meaning mm -hmm. like physical and um, not physical, like emotional health, even uh, physical health in the sense of like nutrition and substance use and just like teaching students about that, of course, at like different developmental stages. And then some and then the other half of the year might be physical health. So I think a lot of schools are implementing those types of curriculum into the larger like physical health there also are big organizations like Shape America, which is really focused on the kind of the holistic approach to teaching our young people about health. My only concern more generally is that in these initiatives, I think they tend to be siloed like once in high school, you have like one health credit or once in middle school. So I think generally we could figure out how we can make that a bigger part of the curriculum, perhaps. But we also know how crowded school days are and how many different requirements students have. But I think it's happening. So we're getting there. Yeah, I um I know in the state of Maryland, our health curriculum or our health um, standards and framework for across kind of K through 12 spectrum very much embeds um, mental health and social emotional development types of areas. There are a report, I was just trying to pull it up because I have a I have a report that looks at what the state policies are. Um, for health curriculum. And it's actually a lot better than you would think in terms of the integration of mental health, but we're certainly not there. It's certainly not in all 50 states. In some states, we have areas where there's, you know, really no talk about mental health or some of these other soft skills that the the question answer, asker seemed to raise. But um, yeah, I think that the, Jody's point about integration and not having such a siloed um, 
effect is 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 really important but it does it it makes sense to be in like a physical and well-being um space and i can also put a plug for um in maryland you know beyond we have a very comprehensive health framework that came out a couple of years ago you could Google it and find it. I'm happy to try to share it after too. That really walks through how to do this well. I know there's a lot of movement towards more wellness and I have a a colleague and friend who is actually our Maryland Teacher of the Year Award and uh, awardee and um, she is a health um, and physical education instructor and has developed wellness curriculum and is looking to get that scaled. And there is interest in Maryland in that. Um, so I can't speak to all of the states, but like I said, there definitely are a lot of states. I would, I think it's about half, if I recall correctly, um, of states actually do have mental health embedded into their health requirements um, in different ways. Um, and certainly there's a movement in that direction. All right. All right, so it looks like we've exhausted a lot of the questions in the chat. So I'll actually finish up on a question of my own. I'm going to play a, a little bit of a devil's advocate here. I think we're all 80s and 90s babies, right? And we have a lot of parents from our generation or our parents, right, saying that schools have actually gone too far, right? They're overly coddling students, right? They're no longer prepared for real life situations in which they do need to show a lot of sort of the mental resiliency and fortitude that we're talking about helping them build in school here. Uh, what would you say to them? Oh, if I'm allowed to jump on my soapbox first, I'd be happy to. Please. Um, you know, I think that there are different layers of this and where that sentiment comes from. Um, and to the extent to which that is actually a, a fear that we're not doing enough in schools around academics, there, there could be an argument for that. Our academic scores are sliding pretty badly. And I know that that's a very real concern. Um, but to think that kids and people, we, we could disentangle our mental, um, our mental, our social, our emotional develop from like our intellectual and academic um, development is just, it's just not true. We just can't do it. Um, and in terms of the schools, the, there's this idea of coddling, there's a few different places I've heard this come up. I think as we've seen schools become, say, more restorative and trying to not be as exclusionary and disciplined, there's a fear that we are, you know, hugging kids when they do wrong and there's no, and, and there's no consequences for anything. But really, the idea of that is just, it's somewhat archaic, this idea that the only way to teach behavior is to punish. That doesn't teach. We need to actually teach behavior. So this idea that we're going to teach kids to be better engaged in a community that they feel no connection to by telling them to just go home and that's going to somehow teach them the behavior we want is ridiculous. It's not going to happen and it's not happening. It's not working. Um, and so if the coddly stuff comes from that is like, where are the consequences? If mm -hmm. you're doing a restorative discipline approach the way it's intended, which not all schools are, just because they say they're doing it doesn't mean they're doing it true to the fidelity, but the true intent behind that is if you connect kids to their community, they have a stake in that community. They have somebody they're accountable to. And then actually then doing something, say, that's in the social realm, that's like disrespectful to a teacher or nasty to their friend, they have a community that they actually want to be a part of that we're holding them accountable within. That's a lot more accountability and much more real life accountability than what you made a mistake, go home for the day, you don't get to be here anymore. Mm -hmm. And then you come back to a community that you're like, I don't even wanna be here today either. So then what have you learned? Oh, I know a great way to get myself home. Um, and you know, in terms of the mental health piece where some people feel like everybody's just coddling these mental health problems and you know if they just got to be stronger and learn to be tough like nobody should learn to be tough because they're being bullied or because there's toxic behavior going on around them we don't tolerate that in our adult spaces why do we think that it's a rite of passage that children and adolescents should just go through school and learn to be have tougher skin mm -hmm. to, to things that are just frankly egregiously inappropriate and and unkind right so i i think that is another space you hear that in sometimes is like the, the, everybody's just so worried um about bullying or you know and and some of that's because some people don't understand the real definition of bullying which is that there's a power differential that there's repeated instances of it and sometimes kids are just being mean and sometimes mm -hmm. they're just being aggressive and when we call it bullying because we're not understanding the definition well then that's not right but at the same time, we shouldn't be like celebrating this idea that this is just a rite of passage of growing up and we want our kids to grow up to be tougher. Um, I don't know, other myths in there, Jody, that I missed <laughs> on the coddling one? No, I don't think so. I think 
I think something, something that comes up in some of our conversations with WellCheck is, well, what if a student identifies as sad when when they're not really sad or when nothing's going on. And I think that what my response is always that something's happening. They might not be, you might not be able to pinpoint their sadness, but they're looking for something. And I think what we, I think what we're seeing from this generation is they're looking for things that might be different than what we were looking for. And so, but I think what we found is that when they feel like their needs are met, they're really us as humans are just like able to thrive. So the needs might look different and might be hard to understand if they were different from our needs or the generation behind us needs, like our parents' generation's needs, because that how that's how they raised us. So I think there's always something there. It's just it's at times it's easier to understand and identify. But I think also one point too that folks also often say too is that they're not in the real world yet, right? Like we want to give them skills and prepare them, but they're not there yet. This is their time to like get that support and care and attention because it does transition when they leave high school and the K-12 system. So it's okay that they're not ready to be adults. I think our goal is to move them in that direction and provide them with a toolbox of skills so when the time comes, they're ready. But I don't think we have to worry about that as much as we might be doing right now. I can add very last thing that there, because yeah. I was obviously pretty like no to everything you just asked, Lindsay. But what I will say I, know, is, I was just I do, looking a question. No, and it's a legitimate one because I hear it all the time. I mean, I hear it in my own circles, right? Um, the the one piece is that there is a little bit of a celebration culture that I think also rubs some people the wrong way. Like, are we celebrating everything that they do and can get a trophy for just being on the team? Yeah, mm -hmm. that part. Yeah. There could be something to that part. I don't know. There's no science. I don't. That's that's just a least pass talking and not like the science talking. Um, you know. So I, I think that that sentiment is very wide held and for a number of different reasons. So I really wanted to try to unpack some of the myths around schools. I think that exist out there. Um, but I, I think there are some things that we've done a little bit with. Like you see a different kind of approach to hovering and curating and planning everything for kids. And that might not actually be the best. And there is some kind of emergence of that, that we're not supporting children's like autonomy development and their ability to navigate the world when adults are wanting to intervene. But that's actually usually something that's being said against parents more than the schools. Uh, that's a slightly different conversation. But yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting looking at looking at that from both sides, right? It's not just, you know, more in, in, in more intense and potentially coddled environment for kids, but that's just a more intense form of parenting. And, you know, people really have to look into sort of how much time they have to put into these things and, you know, where that takes from elsewhere. Uh, but I think with that last answer, we'll wrap things up. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to join you today to address this critically important topic. I'd like to thank you all, our live audience who tuned in today to learn and ask questions. If you'd like to share or rewatch our program, it will be made available at Hopkins at Home website, at the Hopkins at Home website and the Johns Hopkins University YouTube page in the coming days. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about some of the things we talked about today, I encourage you to peruse both of our websites. That's uh, education at jhu.edu and public health at jhu.edu. Uh, thank you all and have a wonderful evening, okay?